Okay, and so here is a brief overview of what I hope to talk about today. Um, our last webinar talked much more about attachment, but a review of attachment more in the context of how we are going to support that in the work we do with um, families. Then I wanna talk about the elements that support parenting. What are those systems that really support effective um, attachment systems um, for parents? And then to talk about our work, how do we, given what we've been um, talking about, what is, what is a nice way to think about interventions that will support healthy and secure attunement and attachment and then last but not least, um, just a little bit about the importance of our helping relationship when we're focused on developing attachment and attunement in caregivers and children. I'm gonna use the terms today, caregiver and parent interchangeably. In my work, we um, work iteratively with biological parents, foster parents, grandparent parents, um, or any, um, you know, different configuration. So I, I'll refer broadly to them. If it's specific to a biological caregiver or something, I will, I will indicate that um, specifically. So as I said before, we're gonna start talking a little bit about um, attachment today, um, not as much theoretical as, as more practical. But really, what is attachment? It's important for us to think about just from, from a foundation that, that attachment's an instinctual process that all mammals possess, and the, the function of it is really to help us stay alive, to promote species survival. And it, attachment isn't a singular thing, it's really about an interaction, right, between the child and a parent and, and their environment, um, environmental context. And attachment, the idea is that it's supposed to result in closeness and contact between a parent and child so that a caregiver can help that child to learn and grow and so that they can help them to be um, safe. Um, and so ultimately the purpose is, is really protection of the child from a biological perspective. Um, we know so much now about brain plasticity and growth through the lifespan, but I do think it's important to say regarding attachment, and I'm quoting here from Bruce Perry, there are critical periods during which bonding experiences must be present for the brain systems responsible for attachment to develop normally. And this occurs during the first year of life. So it is important the work that, that you all do and our work with very young children that this really does set the stage in a very critical way for the way in which a child is able to form relationships and attachments throughout the lifespan. Um, most of you probably think and have heard of um, attachment or attunement processes in terms of serve and return. They refer to an emotional connection that develops between the child and a caregiver in it. And it happens over time. While there's these important critical periods early on, attachment is a process that really has to, to, to develop. And it's this um, balance of a child sharing their, their needs and, and trying to get the attention of their caregiver. And, and then whatever the caregiver's response is to those appeals really shape that attachment relationship and later, again, um, foundations or fundamentals for, for how attachment functions. It's an emotion, it's a lasting emotional connection and importantly, it's a relationship that, that's supposed to provide some sense of, of comfort. And if, if the relationship is gone, or somebody has the sense that there's going to be a loss of that relationship, it causes significant distress. And really, bonding refers to that whole group of behaviors, and I'll refer uh, more specifically to those behaviors on another slide, but is talking about the set of behaviors that really form the foundation of this emotional connection. My own personal definition of attachment is the ability to use another person to feel safe. And again, beginning with that primary caregiver, but then throughout our lifetime, our attachment is reflected in our capacity or our ability to feel safe or to use another person to feel safe, especially if we're distressed or dysregulated. So really early on during that first year primarily, 
these early caregiving experiences really prime or tune our brain into the systems that prepare us for both our response to stress or fear or danger, which we'll really be talking more about traumatic experiences in our third webinar. Um, but, but importantly, they also tune our brains for social emotional experiences. And because the brain is developing in a hierarchy and in a sequence, and those are happening at the very base of our brain, those are also very connected. That is our ability to manage stress, to respond and cope to stress, and our ability to um, engage socially and emotionally with other people are very intertwined. So caregiving experiences very early on prepare the child's brain to live in a world that's similar to the first environment in terms of the level of safety and danger. And they call that implicit perception system neuroception, our ability to scan for and look for danger. So the job is really to set the brain up for the environment. Attachment is promoted through lots of different things, but bonding and detachment are primarily promoted via neurotransmitters um, or protein-like molecules in our brain. Um, and neurons really communicate through these neuropeptides or neurotransmitters. There's two primary um, neurotransmitters that promote bonding, and this is a point of interest largely for me, um, and they're different between men and women. So bonding is promoted in women, as you can see, through oxytocin, um, which acts similarly to an anti-anxiety medication and draws us closer uh, during bonding experiences. Whereas in men, the primary response um, is through vasopressin, which is two things, defense of the homeland, protection, and then also a preoccupation with the safety and well-being of the child and or family. And infants are hardwired. They come into this world ready to engage, and we can watch caregiver brain changes through maternal, um, both pregnancy, prenatally and postnatally in very similar ways as the infant brain um, grows, and much of that is in the attunement um, section of the brain. Um, and stress hormones are suppressed when we have oxytocin, which is also produced during uh, pregnancy experiences. Most importantly, oxytocin is also protective of our brain. Um, it helps to keep it healthy. So what are bonding behaviors? And I'm sure most of you hopefully see these or work toward these, they'll be familiar, but they're nurturing behaviors. They're the look of gaze, um, and, and you can sure say with regard to gaze that, that when you gaze, when there's gaze in a relationship that feels safe and healthy and loving, that you can feel the release of neurotransmitters um, at that point in a positive kind of way. But it also looks like hugs and kisses and holding, and rocking and singing, all of those nurturing routines and behaviors that develop between a caregiver and their child. But it's especially positive physical contact and the ways in which that happens. So generally speaking, it's all about safety in the world. And we use attunement in order to connect and to feel safe. And we feel safe and understood when we're with people in which we receive unconditional positive regard, meaning no matter what you do in this relationship, you're okay, you're worthy of love and belonging. And as we talked about in our previous webinar, really the foundation of attunement processes are what we now know um, as mirror neurons, a form of neuron which allows us to literally imitate the behavior of somebody else or feel the emotions of another person or understand the intentions of another person through, as you can see through the diagram, really a replication of the firing of neurons from one brain to another. So what happens in attunement through mirror neurons, we very carefully read cues or very minute or overt nonverbal behaviors. And then our brains have this same uh, firing of neurons. Um, 
And these systems develop when we're around other systems that have uh, mirror neurons and allow us opportunities for that kind of development. So attunement's this interactive process of being in sync, both behaviorally, but also in terms of thoughts and emotions that involves reading cues. And the idea is that we want to align what the needs are, communicating what the need are, needs are of the infant or the child, and then having an appropriate interpersonal response based on what that need is. And we need to remember, it can be hard sometimes when we're faced with relationships that lack attunement, but attunement can be taught, but it is based on experiences with other attunement, as I mentioned before. Two different quotes I want to share with you regarding attunement and mothers. So a secure mother, a healthy attachment mother, at a very intuitive level, non-conscious level, is continuously regulating the baby's shifting arousal levels, and therefore emotional state. So the first part is this mother reading of the cues or our reading of the cues of the baby or the child, and then shifting their own arousal level to help calm the arousal or the emotional state of their child. And then over thousands and thousands of interactions and experiences with caregivers in those attunement relationships and in our interactions, we develop what are known as attachment schema, which can be called summations of thousands of experiences with caretakers or caregivers that become unconscious, reflexive predictions of the behaviors of others, hardwired to be so. So attunement really serves as this foundation then for, uh, or a building block of attachment or attachment schema. Sensitive caregivers are responsive when their child is distressed, and distress is particularly important when it comes to attunement processes. Um, and it's very important that the, we have these earlier experiences of, of psychobiological regulation through attunement, but especially through um, periods of separation and reunion. So how is that caregiver and their child able to regulate their bodies when they're no longer in the presence. And we'll talk later about how we do some of that as well. Remember that many of these attachment uh, memories um, are formed through implicit memories, those that aren't connected with our thoughts. They're primarily about sensory motor experiences and feelings. And they show up in these automatic beliefs, preferences, and ways of relating to other people, often outside of our awareness. So these repeated interactions with caregivers end up teaching the child about the world, especially about what's safe and what isn't. And we develop this set of beliefs about ourselves and other people in the world based on these experiences. We refer to those as an internal working model. Um, and they're primarily these implicit memories that we're referring to. Attachment is impacted by a number of different factors um, outside of the attunement process. It's impacted, obviously, by the temperament of the in infant. Are they an infant that's irritable or, or fairly easy to soothe? It's certainly impacted by caregiver behavior, how the caregiver acts in the presence of the child. And in particular, behavior that might be shaming. And shame is really a rejection of the worthiness or the value of the child in the child's eyes. Or interfering behaviors, intrusive um, interfering behaviors can impact attachment, certainly maltreatment behaviors. And then traumatic stress. We know that ongoing experiences of either neglect or fear um, interrupt and significantly impact the attachment process. We'll talk about that next webinar. And then it's also about the goodness of fit, right? The, the how the infant's temperament and the caregiver's own temperament and personality fit together. So last couple of points to remember that attachment is really a construct it, um, rather than a trait of a person. And it can be different. We can have different attachments with different caregivers, depending on what those caregiver attachments bring to the relationship. 
and that children have these expectations about how dependable attachment figures are going to be um, in providing them this nurturance and support when they're not feeling safe. An attachment, while I'm going to mention a couple of different classifications of attachment in a moment, it's more important to think about it as a continuum. You can be very securely attached or very able to use other relationships to feel safe, to feel very easily engaged by other people and non-defensive, all the way down to a place of attachment disordered. Research about um, adults in the United States estimate that about 50% of our population have a fully secure attachment, and the other 50% of us are somewhere down the line um, someplace else. Most of you have probably seen basic infant attachment classifications. We won't spend a ton of time, but just important to keep in the back of our mind, these are the four primary um, attachment classifications. I'm going to mention them each on an independent slide. The gold standard is secure attachment. Um, so a young child, zero to three, would feel distressed if they separate, um, and they might express some negative affect or a mood or emotion about it. But then when the caregiver approaches them, um, they know they're going to be comforted, and they approach them, and they feel settled and feel better when they're back with their caregiver after having a time away from them. You can have an avoidant attachment that you just, you don't respond as much when your caregiver leaves. Um, and maybe you have really little reaction when they come back or you, you avoid it altogether. Um, and you may just keep playing with what you're playing with or doing what you're doing. Um, and it's this outward appearance or this inner appearance, I should say, that, that you're strong and you don't need the caregiver because that attachment relationship hasn't been dependable in the past. So it's really an under activation of the attachment system and a decrease in physiological arousal at the removal of the caregiver. And you can have a resistant ambivalent attachment where the child is distressed by separation, but then they just can't be soothed when the caregiver comes back. And maybe they're really angry or they're passive um, and they're really activated in this attachment relationship. And then last but not least, really the only one that's a fully um, unorganized way of using caregivers or other people to feel safe is you get both. You kind of approach and they avoid because they don't know what to anticipate to get from their caregiver. And they can kind of be frozen or, or disoriented when they're with their caregiver because they can't read or predict the behavior that's going to happen. Or sometimes as they get older, it just looks very controlling or very excessive concerns for the caregiver, often in the form of separation anxiety. So the caregiver both creates fear and can be frightened by their child. They're unable to respond to the distress in their child. And their child's attachment behavior makes them feel fearful because of their own history. It's triggered, if you, if you will. Um, and then the caregiver just really doesn't assume the caregiver role anymore. And the child is faced with this dilemma that they can't really go to their caregiver for safety. So let's talk a little bit about some elements of parenting that support healthy attachment. What I want to walk you through next is the five domains of parenting as identified by Dan Hughes. I think these provide a really nice frame to think about as we're intervening with caregivers and building their attachment um, with their children. So these are really the, the main processes that um, parents have. Um, and each of these are driven by particular brain regions or networks. And I'm gonna address each of these independently, but as you can see, there's an approach system, a reward system, a child reading system, <clears throat> excuse me, a meaning making system, and then an executive system to drive it all. So first, the parental approach system. Really, in some ways, this, is, this can be a dichotomy, and this 
functions biologically and instinctually in relationships for, for us as humans, that it's, it's a bit about approach and avoid and a little bit of either or. But this is really a core motivational system if you think about on that, our, our desire or our pull toward our child versus defensiveness and, and retreat from our child um, is really a, a primary driver to how that relationship and attachment looks. Um, parents who have an intact parental approach system, because they haven't had experiences of impaired attachment or maltreatment, et cetera, really it allows the caregiver, the parent to feel safe and to be close in an interaction with their kid. They don't feel threatened by being close and interacting with their child. Um, and it's about these, when you're in these interactions, it's about being sensitive to the sensory experiences that you have with your, with your child, whether that's touch or laughter or any of those things. It, it really is about the sensory experiences. And we're gonna devote a bit of time later to play with children as a mechanism to, to build attachment. But when the parental approach system is engaged, then oxytocin is released. And that calms our amygdala, the fear center of our brain. So ideally with an operational parental approach system, we feel engaged with our, our child, we have a release of oxytocin, and this really minimizes our defensiveness in the interaction with, with our child. And so as Dan Hughes would say regarding this system, it's really the ability to feel safe and stay open and engaged while interacting closely with a child. The second system is the parental reward system. Um, and this is really about social motivation. Um, and ideally, when we interact with our babies and then our older children and hopefully still our adolescents, um, it is a rewarding experience because when we engage in that interaction, there's a release of, of dopamine. And just even remembering this interaction or, or anticipating this interaction can cause the same release of dopamine. Um, but the brains of securely and insecurely attached youngsters or adults can, can work differently. So that if you're really securely attached, then indeed, when you're in an interaction, um, you have an activation of the reward pathways in the brain. But if you have an insecure attachment, remember then there's, there's both of these things happening. There's some reward, some wanting to approach, but also a fear activation response and some desire to avoid um, the interaction because of those fears. So the way Dan Hughes um, phrased this reward system was the ability to experience parenting as pleasurable, satisfying, and rewarding. Now we could probably spend the next several hours of our webinar addressing what the implications are of the current opiate crisis for the parental reward system. And suffice to say that research is pretty clear that if you are blocking, interrupting, um, your pleasure reward system with other kinds of chemicals, then this is certainly going to diminish, replace, et cetera, the, the internal parental reward system that's supposed to happen naturally. So the third system is the child reading system. So this is the ability to understand, tune to, and empathize with our children. So we do this through reading expressions in mirror neurons, um, these attunement processes. We're looking at nonverbal cues. What is the tone and the pace of voice? What are the gestures that we observe? And what is the quality of the touch we experience? And this reading system is mediated by the amygdala so that um, it can filter for threat through neuro neuroceptive processes. Oftentimes this child reading system is referred to as intersubjectivity, while subjectivity is understanding our own experiences, then intersubjectivity is really, really understanding the subjective experience of another person and our interrelated 
um, experiences together. Or another way it's referred to as really mind-to-mind -mind communication, no words. It's also called mentalization um, and is similar to what we know as um, theory of mind. And research, some research has indicated that when there is oxytocin present, that this improves that our child reading system is better engaged. And there's even been some clinical applications for that, for that use with children with autism um, and some other circumstances. And the fourth system is the parental meaning making system. So really, it's, it's that narrative that we provide for ourselves. It's the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are as a parent. It's the story we tell ourselves about what our children are like, what their personality is like, what their character is like. It's a function that happens really in our thinking brain, way up in the prefrontal cortex. And, and our meaning-making system happens as parents, as our brain matures, but in particular, when we have experiences to reflect on these things, how we see ourselves as a parent, how we view the nature of our child. And it's strongly influenced by our own history so that if we have a history in which we did not have a lot of meaning making opportunities, then we won't do so as well. And if we have what we referred to earlier as an internal working model that's negative, then that will taint our meaning-making system um, that we make for both ourselves as caregivers, but also for our children and their character. So the way Dan Hughes stated this one was the ability to make sense of one's experiences as a parent to create a coherent personal narrative about being a parent. And then lastly, the number five, the parental executive system. So this really is the one that pulls everything to, together. Um, and you can, you can think of three components of this executive system, um, mentalization, parental self-control, and parental self-monitoring. And I'll say a couple words about each of those next. But really, this sits in the wheelhouse of all of those other systems that we've been talking about taking the input um, from those systems and making decisions, hopefully as a parent, from a thinking uh, place. So the way Dan Hughes referred to this one is the ability to regulate one's internal states, monitor the quality of the parent-child connection, and engage in timely, effective repair. Cassie, can I stop for one quick second? We do have a question that was chatted in. Um, and it's from, uh, from Melanie and her crew. And the question is, is there a difference in the reward system effects between someone consistently using MAT like Suboxone versus someone using drugs intermittently on the street? That is a really good question. And I actually just had a discussion with my CPP learning community group regarding that. Um, I, I have to be honest with you as a group, I don't know medically the, the full answer to that, other than to say um, it is a receptor blocker, but does it result in the same pleasure high? So does it have an impact? Um, all evidence suggests yes, but I don't know that we fully understand that at this, at this point in time. I think there are also a lot of, one of the things we talked about yesterday, a lot of other things around the, the medical use of Suboxone and, and Methadone um, that can also impair the attunement processes. And some of those are just level of alertness um, aside from the reward system. And, and I think sometimes they can, they can impede just the ability to, to reflect or to, to have alertness or awareness. Does that make sense? Or were there other questions regarding that? Let me know via, via chat. And Katie, I'm sorry, I didn't see it because that was minimized on mine. I appreciate you letting me know. Oh, it did come back. There we go. I've got it now. Thanks, that's it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, back to my screen. Sorry about that, folks. There we go. So just as a reminder here, we're doing the Executive Center of Attachment. Mentalization was the first component of that. So 
mentalization really is thinking um, about our relationships and about the emotions of another person. It's an intentional process, it's a thinking process, as I've said. It's in our ability to understand both verbal and nonverbal communication from, what, from another person or our child. And it should result in really high awareness of the other person's emotions. Um, and and mirror neurons, it's, it's the result, it's really been attributed to mirror neurons. And the other um, mammals that appear to have this same capacity are elephants, apes, dolphins, and whales, but not dogs, notably. The next part is parental self-monitoring. There's a particular brain region, the AC, as you can see there, that's responsible for, for, for doing this, and it's really about air detection. So it remains active when we notice that we're trying to reach a goal, we're trying to be a certain way with our child, we're trying to achieve a certain thing about our child, and we're not, we're not achieving that. For example, asking our child to do their homework and they're having a meltdown um, in the relationship. That would be the feedback that our goal of having that happen is, is not being accomplished, for example. But then we, we make adjustments in attunement and we respond hopefully in a way that is sensitive and lets the other person know about this. Um, and it results in an awareness of just each person's sensitivity. So it's our monitoring ourselves, being sensitive to our impact on our child. And then hopefully parental self-control. That It's really the link between our emotional limbic system and our thinking brain or the prefrontal cortex. And hopefully it does so in a flexible way. It's able to connect our thoughts and our feelings um, and link the process of really regulating and calming our emotions enough to bring our thinking brain, our prefrontal cortex, to bear through reflection. And it's activated when the amygdala reacts to something. And what it tries to do is control negative reactions, override those negative reactions of fear and anger so that they don't spill on to the child through the caregiver relationship. All right. I'm gonna move on to our next section. And what I'm gonna to try to do um, is hopefully leave us a couple of minutes at the end for um, some questions. So promoting secure attachment, attunement and attachment. So what I'd like to share with you next is the PACE approach by Hughes and Balin. Uh, Balin. And as you can see, these can be coupled with the parental um, approach systems, the parental systems that we've been talking about, referred to as PACE. And it has to do with playfulness, acceptance, curiosity, and empathy. And I'm gonna address each of those, but as you can see, playfulness really taps into the Bose approach and reward systems, whereas acceptance is really about being able to approach our child Curiosity is really driven by our child reading and meaning making systems. And our capacity for empathy as a caregiver is an integration of these systems, emotions plus reflection and mindfulness. Play, such, as you all know, plays such a fundamental role in the development of attachment and attunement. So when we're talking about play in this way, we're talking about really fully engaged interactions. And when we have play that is in an attuned matter fully engaged, then there's also the stimulation of neurochemicals, opiates and, and dopamine that um, promote attachment. Play also activates our thinking brain though. It activates our prefrontal cortex and, and quality play that's attuned should be characterized by a sense of relaxation and reciprocity between the child and the kid. There should be a, a bit of hopefulness to the play. And certainly, as we talked about before, a sense of unconditional positive regard that really there's limited correction um, in this process. It's about conveying a sense of worthiness to the child. The second, um, word in pace is acceptance. One of my favorite statements from Dan Hughes is that really a, self, a child's self-concept is derived by what they see in their caregiver's eyes. So the child's social engagement system um, happens when they're with a caregiver that is calm and helps them to feel calm. 
And it's really about a heart and a brain connection, being able to feel safe enough and connected and also to engage our, our thinking brain. Um, we'll talk more when we talk about trauma, but shame um, can really play a shutdown role in the process of acceptance. Um, and so shame really is growth suppressing. Uh, when we feel shameful, it makes us feel worthless of loving and belonging. So it promotes self-defensiveness and it can have result in problems with intimacy and parenting. The third piece to the acronym is curiosity. And I think there's probably nothing more than our promotion of curiosity for parents and for parents to promote curiosity in their children. So curiosity is about um, wondering about reactions, both in, in themselves, why they're reacting to their child in a particular way, but also wondering about why their child is reacting to particular circumstances um, as well. It's a means to build a child's understanding of themselves. So it's the caregiver really describing what they see and how they understand their experiences so that that builds the child's self-concept and self-understanding. But it requires caregivers not to personalize behaviors, to feel like they're being attacked or manipulated in some kind of way. Um, and it's really about encouraging caregivers to think about if a child has a challenging behavior, what is behind that? What is, is there a skill or an experience or challenge developmentally that, that has happened that really underlies the difficult or challenging behavior? So helping caregivers to reflect about their experiences, I think, is twofold. And some of it is helping caregivers to think about their own caregiving experiences. So, for example, asking, I would, would I choose to parent my child in the same way I was raised? Do I believe that how my parents raised me has an impact on how I raise my child today? And now that I'm a parent, do I realize that, that their parents could have mis misunderstood her reactions? Do I have a new view on how my parents might have seen me? And do I understand that my behavior toward my child cannot be explained? Or do I believe that my, my behavior toward my child can't be explained how I was raised? That it's independent of my own caregiving history. And then thinking some, some prompts for helping a caregiver to think about their child's behavior. So understanding why the child behaves in a certain way helps them not to be so upset. Um, they might state that I believe that there's just no point in trying to guess how my child feels. Do they make an effort? The best way to get your, your child to know you love them is when they're well behaved. Is that a belief that the caregiver has? Does a caregiver believe that the only time that they're certain their child loves them is when the child is smiling at them? Or do they hate it when their child cries or talks to them in a way when they're on the phone or um, interacting in some other kind of way? And do they feel like they always know what their child wants? Or are they curious about that? And E is about empathy. Empathy this is a quote from Brene Brown, and then I'm going to show you a quick little video snippet that a few of you may have seen, but really describes empathy in a way better than, than anything else I have seen. I'm going to do these two pieces for you next. So here's the quote. Empathy is a strange and powerful thing. There is no script. There is no right or wrong way to do it. It is simply listening, holding space, withholding judgment, emotionally connecting and communicating that incredibly healing message of you're not alone. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, 
the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh uh-huh. No, you want a sandwich? Um, Empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. (laughs) John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. I I just think that... um... It's so well put. And when I think about that, I'm, I, I think that applies to both the response between the caregiver and their child when their child's distressed or upset. And I also think it, it relates to our responses to the caregivers that we're working with. Um, I'm going to move us forward, and I'm aware that I'm probably going to move us past a couple of slides. We'll certainly make the slide deck uh, available, as always, I've included um, absolutely everything that I wanted to talk with you about today. Um, A few things that I think you probably already do just in support of empathy, that it's really about listening and validation, encouraging caregivers to pause and wait for their child to have a, a chance to respond. It's about reflecting back to their child, what their child's trying to tell them, but, but not being a detective about things um, in terms of how does that make you feel? Are you sad? Are you mad? Are you upset? Um, but it is also sometimes stating the feelings behind the words when, when our child is upset or angry. Um, and it's about matching the affect intensity. So even though sometimes little children's problems seem smaller in our world, they feel just that big. And if we can show them that we understand the level of intensity, it can have a very calming effect. Oftentimes it's referred to as don't dismiss and deny, don't make it minimal or try to sweep it under the carpet really address the issue in the way that it shows that you understand the significance. This is the section that I'm going to move us through. Um, Certainly play forms the foundation of an attachment relationship. Um, And we probably could spend an entire hour webinar on the facilitation of play in this context. So please forgive me. I'm going to move through just a couple to the section I want to get to with you. Okay. So the last section is regarding um, really using the helping relationship to promote growth and healing. So I can't understate that I truly believe and see happen again and again that most of the beautiful changes for caregivers in terms of the way they attune and attach to their children happens through their experiences with other providers and caregivers who help them experience that same thing. So much of what we do is we attune with caregivers and some of those, many of those who have not had the kind of attunement experiences that we would hope they would have had. So parents really build their attunement capacity through experiences with other attuned people. And those really are the most profound changes. 
But I think, and I certainly will admit that often our first impulse when we see a caregiver that isn't nurturing or that is really misattuned or lacks attunement can be our own feeling of rejection of that caregiver or anger. I want to remind us that um, when we understand attunement and attachment processes and we're work working to build those in the folks we work with it, really we are the tool by which that happens. And we are only as effective as we allow ourselves to be. Meaning it's really important for us to understand our, oops, sorry about that, our own background. Taking the time in your own space to think about how your overall experiences with caregivers have affected your adult personality. Whether there's anything you learn from your own childhood experiences about relationships. And encouraging caregivers on the flip side to really think about 20 years from now what they would want for their child. The way that we support ourselves as tool in attunement, as reparative attachment relationship, really is through embracing self-reflective self practice. So when we have opportunities that we think about who we are in these relationships, and about our histories, it relates in behavioral process changes and attitudinal changes in the folks that, with whom we work. It results in new knowledge or adjustments to be made in the way that we practice. And it allows us to improve our skill, whatever our skill or practice is, or to supervise folks um, in, a, in a better way toward, toward their own development. It also forces us to really think about the relationship as the client versus the caregiver or the child. And that really our job is to focus on the relationship and the attachment relationship between a caregiver and the child. And I find it very challenging, but very important that we balance our empathy for both the child and caregiver simultaneously. Um, I find that it tends to, to veer back and forth between the two, but to really hold those simultaneously um, is challenging both of those perspectives. Um, and to really think about how both of those partners are affecting each other, given what they bring to the relationship. Much of our job in building attachment is what they refer to in CPP as serving as conduit facilitating the communication between the two and really helping the caregiver and the child understand where each other's coming from and helping caregivers to understand their own child's developmental needs. And sometimes it takes the form of what they call speaking for baby, literally providing the words that you think the baby or the young child would be saying to the caregiver in that moment. Sometimes it involves gossiping or talking to the caregiver in a way that the parent can purpose, the child can purposely hear or vice versa, speaking to the child in a way that the parent can hear so that you can deliver important messages about their relationship. In all of our work, we want to frame benign intentions or really help to look for the benevolent meaning behind the caregiver or the child's behavior. It's looking for the good behind the intentions and even really upsetting parental actions like spanking a child or yelling at a child, for example, in our presence, often are driven by a desire to, to keep their child safe. And so we know that we build attachment when we help each other to begin to look for the good intentions behind people's actions. Much of what attachment um, has taught us is that it's about the repair in relationships and certainly the repair after distress or conflict. So as Patricia Van Horn would say, remember, often it's not finding the perfect answer that matters, but what we do to repair the relationship when we make a mistake in our interventions. And this is true for both the caregivers and their children, but also for us. And then one last rubric that I think are important for us to think about in our work in building attachment is um, a model developed by Daniel Siegel. Um, and it's about showing up and resetting. So beginning with a quote again from Brene Brown, that really courage starts with showing up and letting ourselves be seen. If we're gonna build attachment relationships, it requires 
the most of our humanness and the most of our vulnerability and courage to help caregivers to do the same thing. So the RESET acronym refl refers to first to reflex or to be reflective, to think about the relationship with the caregiver, to think about the relationship with the caregiver and the child and how you want to intentionally build that. I love the second one, embrace ignorance. We don't necessarily understand the family circumstances. We don't have all the answers to the circumstances. And it's okay to acknowledge our mistakes and the places in which we don't have answers. Shuttle refers to our need to check in with our body, heart, and history, meaning are we having reactions to this caregiver and or this child? Are we becoming um, aroused through the parallel arousal cycle as we see a caregiver get upset? Can we help ourselves provide good attunement models by being able to remain calm in the face of distress so that we can um, more effectively interact. E refers to empathy again, that just like we want parents to have empathy for their children to really understand their circumstances, we also want to be able to attune, absorb, and articulate our empathic response to the caregivers we're working with. And then last but not least is transcend. And what's meant by transcend is have the courage, take the time to understand our own attachment relationships and history so that we don't transmit those into the relationships with the people that we're working with. What Dan Siegel says about this is the gold is in the shadows. And what that means is that those things about our history, those things about ourselves, that are the most painful or the least likable or the most difficult to look at, we often avoid, but it's those exact things that have the most power to make change in our lives and certainly the most power to make change in, in the relationships that we have in, in our life. So as promised, with a few skipped slides, we have a couple of minutes for question and answer, and I think for the purpose of this, it would be okay to go ahead and unmute yourself and make a verbal question as well. I just unmuted everyone, so anybody should feel free to go ahead and pipe in if you have a question. It certainly was a lot of material, folks, and I just wonder if there are any last thoughts you have about the use of, of attachment building in your work or any questions about the material that I shared with you today. And just kind of get a feel for that's right from the law. I Say that again. I think that was a background. Oh. We don't have any questions, but it was really helpful. Kathy was just showing it at TLC, and she was just kind of talking about her family that we were going along, and I think it's really helpful information. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, the, the same person was a little bit hard to hear. I. I appreciate that. I think it's um, some, one thing to talk about building attunement and attachment, but I think it's incredibly challenging uh, work to do, and especially the work we do with many of the families that I know you all work with. And I, the last thing I guess I would share um, is uh, just some very, very powerful experiences I've had during at least the last couple of, of years in uh, child parent psychotherapy um, that that I really think the most significant changes that we're seeing in caregivers really is this ability to in a non judgmental way think about their own history as it relates to their child not because they have an awful history or have done anything bad per se but because we all become better parents when we think about our own attachment history and how we feel in terms of safety in, in relationships. So I, I truly hope that there's, there's pieces that you can carry forward in your work, everyone, um, to build those systems. And I, I look forward to our next webinar.
So thank you for that segue, Cassie. Um, our next webinar will be held on June 15th. It'll be 9.30 to 10.30 again. And, and that webinar's uh, title is Addressing Trauma and Traumatic Loss with Young Children and Their Caregivers. So following this webinar uh, later this afternoon, I will send out the evaluation link for this presentation, uh, as well as a copy of Cassie's slides. And then uh, later, either with that email or, or later on this week or early next week, I will also share the recording link for this uh, presentation. Um, so with that, I wanna thank Dr. Yackley for her presentation um, and thank you all for your time and joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you in person at the HFA Spring Learning Exchange next month um, or here again on this webinar on June 15th. So have a wonderful day, everybody, and we will see you soon. Thank you.